Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Come on. Okay. Ведущих стран Европы. Yeah, we need the NATO. We are present everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Olaker, here in my home in front of a computer. And this is Hugh Pope, your co-host from his home as well. So although we are outside of our studio and trying new technologies to record, we're really pleased to have with us virtually from Istanbul, Turkey, our colleague, Burkay Mandirachi. Burkay is one of our excellent Turkey analysts, and he has a new commentary recently published titled Sharing the Burden, Revisiting the EU-Turkey Migration Deal. It's an amazing turnaround. We thought that everything had been sorted out in 2015-2016 when there was the original immigration emergency on the borders of Turkey and Greece, and Turkey and the European Union came to uh, what seemed to be a very generous deal by which the European Union agreed to pay 3 billion euros in first instance. They later extended to a second tranche of 3 billion in order for Turkey to look after refugees in its own geography. What happened? Thank you very much for having me, first of all. Yeah, well, I mean, the migration deal had actually already been hanging by a thread before. And now with the recent developments, and I mean the decision by Turkey to open its borders to Greece, to the passage of migrants, it has come under even more pressure. What we have seen is on the 28th of February, Turkey decided to open its borders to Greece, land borders and the sea border across the Aegean into Greek islands. And thousands of migrants actually crossed or attempted to cross at least to Europe in search for a better life. And this has very much reminded us of the scenes we came across in 2015 and 16. And it has really increased sort of the fear of a new influx into the EU. And the the numbers are obviously quite disputed. Initially, the UN said that there were 13,000 migrants who actually moved towards the border areas the land border. And then, you know, obviously, when Greece pushed back and did not allow people to cross into uh, their territory, uh, many people decided to go back and the numbers that were left at the border actually decreased. So now we're looking at around four or 5,000 people who are stranded at the border. Some people also in villages across the border area along the Meric or Evros River that sort of divides the Greece-Turkey border. They are obviously in very bad conditions right now. They have set up plastic tents, you know, very overcrowded. Temperatures are still below zero degrees Celsius. So they are quite in horrible conditions right now. So Burkha, what what happened? Why did Turkey do this? Did something go wrong with the deal? I mean, there's a deal in place. Is Turkey violating it? Yeah, well, I mean, Turkey's grievances with regard to the EU not living up to its promises as part of the migration deal have been rising for quite some time already. Obviously, Turkey has done a very generous job of hosting more than 4 million refugees in Turkey. This includes other refugee groups, you know, 300,000 asylum seekers as well that are non-Syrian. And, you know, as part of the deal that Turkey and the EU had cut, there were provisions that were promising a couple of things to Turkey. I mean, first of all, visa liberalization was part of it. Modernization of the customs union was another element. And rejuvenating the accession process between Turkey and EU was also part of it. And no meaningful progress has been made on these aspects. The only thing that has worked with the deal probably better than the others, was the money that the EU actually sent to Turkey to to support the integration of Syrian refugees. And, you know, the 6 billion that they had agreed to, now 3.2 billion have been dispersed and, you know, the rest has been committed. So it is going to come. The money is going to come. But I think the timing of this decision is also critical because it came right on the same night as 34 Turkish soldiers were killed in Idlib. It was actually one hour after that. So there was probably also an intention on part of Ankara. The timing of this decision is also connected to sort of trying to contain the blowback that could have happened after the attack in Idlib because it was the highest toll attack that the Turkish military suffered in the last two decades. And Ankara was really worried of the blowback it could have caused domestically. So you're saying that this was to take the take the pressure off what was going on in Idlib. How does this take the pressure off? How does that work? What's the logic? 
I mean, Turkey is really eyeing to get more support from the West and the Europeans with regard to what it is doing in Idlib because Turkey is really concerned about the new influx of refugees from there. There are around 3 million civilians in Idlib. 1 million have already been displaced towards the border areas recently. And there is a risk, you know, that more people might actually be displaced soon with the offensive that is ongoing there, the regime offensive into urban areas. So that's sort of the main worry of Ankara, of, you know, more people coming in. And they are really trying to push more, the EU more, to support its course in Idlib, but also to support civilians. And this includes humanitarian aid, obviously, to the people there, but also aid or support to, you know, building critical infrastructure, you know, medical facilities, schools, and, and all these are part of the package of asks that Ankara has from the EU. But Bekai, isn't this going to be perceived as incredibly cynical in Brussels and by EU member states as well? I mean, relations between Turkey and Europe have reached the rock bottom that we've known since uh, all the violations of human rights, disturbances around Cyprus and uh, the jailing of lots of people. Was this how on earth could Turkey expect this to work in its favour? Yeah, you're right. I mean, Turkey-EU relations have been spiralling downwards for quite some time already. And, you know, recently... There were other issues that, you know, came on the agenda where the two sides, you know, found themselves pit against each other. I mean, Libya being one of them, the tensions in the East met also being one of them. So in general, we've seen, and obviously after the coup attempt in Turkey, there has been quite a democratic decline or the trajectory in Turkey in terms of the democratic standards has been declining quite rapidly. And that has also soured relations with, you know, journalists being imprisoned, opposition figures being imprisoned. That has also contributed to sort of the bigger picture souring of relations. And the migration deal and or the cooperation that they had, that Turkey and the EU had on migration was sort of the only area they could really constructively engage on. And, you know, now with the deal being put into question with this recent decision, and really the, the EU really sees this as sort of a blackmail of Turkey. And I've been talking to European officials about this, and they're really saying that they're concerned about appearing to be giving in to this perceived blackmail by Ankara right now, kind of offering something in return for what they did, because all of this, it would not fly with the European public, which is very anti-Turkey. And it would also set a precedent for other countries to exploit, sort of use the refugee card against the EU to get concessions from them. We are sort of in a position where Ankara is really trying to pressure the EU to get something out of this move. Uh, But on the other hand, it it looks like, you know, it has re-engaged the two right now. But in the long run, it doesn't seem like the EU is going to just give in to what Ankara did because of the concerns that I just outlined. So, Burkai, they got something, right? They got a call last week with German Chancellor Angela Merkel, with French President Emmanuel Macron and British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, together with the Turkish President Erdogan. And I think the purpose of the call was to try to sort this out. Did the call sort this out? Yeah, I mean, the call was that actually was going to be a summit in Istanbul initially, but then uh, that was cancelled because of the coronavirus. So they turned it into a video conference call. It did not sort out. There has not been a concrete outcome of that meeting in terms of, you know, resolving the migration crisis. Macron, Mrs. Merkel made statements on the fact that they could maybe consider offering more financial support to civilians in Idlib, but also to refugees in Turkey, or they could, you know, discuss the customs union, modernization of the customs union. But beyond that, there has not really been any concrete outcome. There was a sort of a diplomatic traffic that the border decision initiated before, you know, Erdogan and Turkish foreign minister also went to Brussels. There were high level meetings in Ankara. But so far, because of this reluctance of the EU to appear as if it is giving in to Ankara's blackmail, I don't really expect any quick fix to this whole spat. I mean, I think they will probably try to drag it along a bit more so that in the end, even if they do something, it will not look like they have given in to Ankara's circling. Right, because they don't want more of this, right? They want to make sure this doesn't happen again. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the situation in Idlib, obviously, the humanitarian fallout there is concerning for them because if really one million people now flock in into Turkey because of the deteriorated security situation there, then it might all turn much more difficult to control. It's only been a few thousand that went to the border right now, and that has already created quite a chaos. Imagine now a million people coming into Turkey and a portion of them going to Turkey-Greece borders, and that could create even more chaos. Berkay, it sounded like uh, this migration 
deal that is stumbling quite a lot is the main hope that Turkey has to put its relationship with the EU back on the rails. Where do you see the migration deal within all the other things? Is there no hope on the horizon? I mean, Turkey struggles always to add up to more than the sum of its parts, but its parts are really important. I mean, Libya, there's Cyprus, there's East Med Gas, there's Russia, NATO, Syria, so many issues that the EU needs to cooperate with Turkey on. And yet, uh, is there no hope anywhere? I mean, the Turkey-EU relationship has turned more transactional over the last couple of years. And that obviously is very much, I mean, you can, you can see this in the kind of logic of this deal as well. Turkey keeping refugees in Turkey, helping them out and, you know, caring for them in return for the EU, taking steps on, you know, critical issues like visa liberalization, customs union upgrade and accession. When, when we started with the accession process, the accession uh, negotiations were the main framework for Turkey-EU relations. And that was sort of the aim of, you know, Turkey becoming a full member of the EU at some point. But now with the turn of the relationship more transactional and, you know, that was sealed with this deal as well, accession just became one element of this migration deal. That sort of shows how this relationship has turned very transactional. But then that being said, I still feel that the sort of accession framework the two are still upholding, despite everything, is still the main framework they can cooperate on. And I don't feel that there's a better framework in general. So I feel like we have this migration deal now is valuable in that it keeps some of the relations afloat, at least. And there is some convergence of interest and accession is part of it. Okay, but I think it's good that accession is still kept on the agenda somehow. They might have interest in cooperating on refugees right now, but you never know what's going to happen in like five, ten years in the EU or in Turkey. And, you know, keeping the prospect of accession, I think, is beneficial for both and just for the two sides to cooperate and find areas of cooperation beyond migration. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and Hugh and I are talking to our colleague, Burkai Mandirachi, about Turkey and the European Union. So I think that's a really interesting framework you've put out there just now, Burkai, this idea that while no one really expects a session anytime soon, it's also just a terrible idea to pull the plug on it. But it creates this challenge, right, that you're promising something, you're promising continuing conversations on something that no one sees a real way forward on. You already had the frustration with all of it even before the relationship nosedived for all of these other reasons. So in your, in your commentary, you talk a little bit about some of the specific things that can be done. Can you talk a little bit more, other than keeping the door open on accession, what else is really possible? And how do you see the EU and Ankara moving forward? I mean, I think the accession process still has, although, you know, the, the end goal of it, the two sides seem to be quite far apart, it still makes quite a lot of contribution in terms of the exchanges of, let's say, mid-level bureaucrats, of legal practitioners with all the twinning projects that are ongoing. And, you know, the, the funding, obviously, it has been cut, but it's still coming in. Also, the youth projects, obviously, Erasmus and, and all that. I think on the social level, on a more bottom-up level, I think it still has sort of a trickle-down effect. And, you know, it, it keeps the prospect of Turkey being anchored in sort of European framework alive. And I think that's good to preserve, at least for now, when, you know, at the top, things are not going that well. That's where I see the value of accession, of, of keeping the accession prospects open. And beyond accession, coming back to the second part of your question, I think for now, I mean, I have a very pragmatic perspective on this. So if Turkey and the EU have interest in cooperating with refugees right now and don't have much interest in cooperating on the other issues, then we should try to salvage that framework of cooperation and of trying to identify areas of this cooperation where it could actually be more possible. And obviously, I mean, there are three or four aspects. One is more support for refugees in Turkey, Syrian refugees in Turkey. So six billion supposed to be channeled to the projects by 2025. But some of these projects are also running out earlier. So around 600,000 school kids, for example, Syrian school children, are getting support under the scheme, and that's running out soon. There are around 1.7 million refugees who get humanitarian aid, actually, which is also part of this funding, which is also going to come to an end fairly soon. So there are really, you know, still emergency needs of Syrians in Turkey, where the EU needs to ramp up more support. And 
humanitarian aid in Idlib is the other aspect of it. Obviously, we have an impending humanitarian crisis uh, going on there. And, you know, I've been talking to our Syria analysts as well, and they've been saying, well, the needs of the people there have really become very pressing. And we have the humanitarian situation is deteriorating. It's not only about humanitarian aid, but also medical support. Now with the coronavirus, that has also come more on the agenda. Uh, You know, more need for schooling, education, infrastructure facilities that are completely lacking there. So there is a huge need for like more money, humanitarian aid and assistance to come to Turkey. I think that's an area where the EU has also shown willingness to support Turkey more. The other he asks of Ankara, uh, visa liberalization, that's a bit difficult to solve. Is that going to happen? You know, how practical is visa liberalization? Particularly given the refugee influx, I would think that would make it harder, not easier. Well, I mean, because visa liberalization also depends on Ankara actually fulfilling 72 criteria. They have fulfilled uh, 66 in this four-year period since the deal. Six are still pending. One of them is the reform of the anti-terror laws of Turkey, which is very contentious in Turkey because of the fight against you know different groups that are designated as terrorists. That's very difficult for Turkey to move ahead right now on visa liberalization. But even if it were to c- complete those six criteria... There is nearly no willingness on part of the EU to accept visa-free travel for Turkish citizens. This is decided on the co-decision procedure in the EU mechanism. So the parliament has equal say. And, you know, anti-Turkey sentiments in the parliament are really running high. So I don't see this being ratified by the parliament at all. And obviously now the trend is the other way around. Europe is trying to shield its borders from refugees. And generally there's this sort of fear of, you know, more people coming in if we grant visa-free travel to Turkish citizens. So I don't see that prospect moving forward at all. And what about the customs union, Burkay? Well, the modernization of the customs union is an area that Turkey and the EU could cooperate on. would be more likely for them um, compared to visa liberalization. Uh, It's obviously a very complex set of items that need to be dealt with there. And I don't see sort of the customs union as a package uh, being modernized anytime soon. But there are some areas where the EU and Turkey actually share interests, especially in the FTA agreements that the EU is signing with third party states, where Turkey is asking to have a seat on those negotiations. There is room to explore in the area of the customs union moder- modernization, more so than visa liberalization or rejuvenation of the accession process. So, Burke, if I'm getting it right, the migration deal is in tatters, but we really think that's the best hope for the EU and Turkey to work forward together. But isn't there a wrinkle in this that most of the refugees that are currently waiting in these desperate circumstances on the border are not actually Syrians and the EU wants to deal with Syrians? Can you go into a bit of that? And also, if there is to be an improvement between the EU and Turkey, perhaps there's a very significant number of Turks who really want to be anchored in European values and a European relationship. The majority of those who are attempting to cross or are crossing right now through the Greece-Turkey border they're actually not Syrians. Most of them are Afghans. They are irregular migrants and, you know, a large majority of them Afghans. There has been a sharp increase in the number of Afghans who crossed into Turkey, mostly from Iran, by the way, in the last couple of years. But there is a huge mix of irregular migrants who have been trying to cross through Turkey or who came to Turkey to work in the informal economy from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Somalia, also from West African states. The numbers are difficult to come by, but we know there are 300,000 non-Syrians registered who are seeking international protection. 170,000 of those are Afghans and, you know, up to 1 million are estimated to be undocumented. And they are usually leading hidden lives in Turkey's bigger cities. They live under very precarious conditions because they don't have aid and access to humanitarian aid and other assistance as much as Syrians do. So this has really turned into a bigger issue over the last years. And obviously, in 2016, Syrians were the main subject of this deal, and they might be again if there is an influx from Idlib. But there's also this huge bulk of irregular migrants, which currently, you know, is not formulated within this deal. And it's a new reality that maybe needs to be taken into account when revisiting the migration deal. There are organizations that offer support to these irregular migrants and to registered migrants of other nationality. And, you know, we were saying in the commentary that you know, maybe the EU could explore 
what it can do to help these organizations to increase their capacity so they can reach out to these vulnerable people and offer more support to them. But that's definitely an issue that has also come about with the recent border decision, more cooperation needed on irregular migrants. So one of the reasons that everyone is currently shutting down borders rapidly has nothing to do with migration and everything to do with that virus that made the summit uh, between the four leaders virtual rather than physical. Do you think there's room to explore response to COVID-19 as a place where cooperation is possible? I think it makes civilians and refugees much more vulnerable. Obviously, they don't have access to medical care as much. And especially in, in Idlib, this is a huge problem. But also for Syrians who are not registered in Turkey or for undocumented migrants in Turkey, I think the, the fear of the spread of the coronavirus makes ramping up cooperation also much more imminent. Obviously, whatever we say on the coronavirus is going to be very speculative right now because we don't know the extent and how long it will keep us busy. But, you know, what we've seen now, especially in Europe, it has sort of fueled anti-refugee migrant sentiments. And there, you know, it could lead to even less willingness to sort of agree to any sort of resettlement scheme. It could fuel debates around, well, we need to keep our borders shut because we fear the coronavirus could spread even more. Obviously, it also, as you said, Olya, it overshadows many of the other important discussions um, leaders should be having right now, the situation in Idlib, but also like now the situation at the Turkey-Greece border. The coronavirus is the main agenda item. I mean, we don't know how it's going to impact the economy, but could imagine if it continues for uh, longer, there's going to be more money that will go into the health sector and improving health services. And, you know, that might lead to cuts in the money that is available for displaced persons or for civilians, or it could drag it along a bit more because, you know, governments are undecided where to spend their money. Uh, We've heard from local aid organizations on the ground that they have also cut back on their staff and halted some of their outreach activities for some needy people. So that has already started to some degree, which obviously makes the situation of these vulnerable people much more precarious. That's how I very speculatively see how the coronavirus coronavirus could be impacting all of this. Thank you, Burkai. I mean, we're out of time, but uh, I found this really informative. I would advise everyone to check out Burkai's commentary, Sharing the Burden, Revisiting the EU-Turkey Migration Deal. We're going to keep recording through the crisis. We're going to see how this goes with all of us in our homes and guests, wherever the guests are. But we really hope that you tune in because we expect to have a few more really interesting conversations. Big thanks to Miranda Sunnix, who always uh, make sure that the logistics run at our end. War and Peace is a part of the Europod podcast network, and you should check out some of the other podcasts. Thanks, as always, to all of our listeners for tuning in. And thank you from me. And you can find all our Turkey work from the golden age of Europe-Turkey convergence in the late 1990s and uh, 2000s and all the way to the current situation on the Turkey page of our website, www.crisisgroup.org. So thanks again, Burkai, and listeners, we'll be talking to you again in two weeks. Thank you very much for having me. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.